share with you today the scripture text on which this sermon is based. And it's going to come from uh, the Gospel of John in the 19th chapter at the 38th through the 42nd verse. Uh, we've been in the Gospel of John for most of this uh, series called Not a Fan, Becoming a, Co- a Fully Devoted or Committed Follower of Jesus Christ. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloth, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now, there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh, glorious God, I give you the praise for the privilege that it is each day to share your words, to live in your life and love. I pray that your love would pour out through these words, that they would not be mine, but the living word in Jesus. Lord, guide me, use me as an instrument for your glory. Speak your word through me, that we might be blessed and by it be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. The series theme verse uh, for this series we've been in, not a fan, is from Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. Then he said to them all, If anyone wants to come to me, this is Jesus saying to his followers, If you want to follow me, then you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Following, first of all, is a choice. If anyone wants to come to me, we have to make the decision whether we do or do not want to come to Jesus. Following is a commitment. Deny himself, take up his cross daily. We must be committed to saying, not my will, just as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, but yours, God, be done. And following is a course when Jesus said, and follow me. This following of Jesus, it is a pathway. There is a pathway. And on the pathway, there is a progress of change. Changes in the life and the relationship of a Jesus fan on the way to becoming a completely committed follower of Christ. Nicodemus was one who exemplified this transition. He moved from being a fan of Jesus to a follower of Christ. A few weeks ago, we were introduced to Nicodemus when he was uh, reading or when we read about his life when he came to Jesus with a question. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Notice that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. He came to him as a secret agent believer, or as one of those old uh, programs I used to watch, he came as Nick at night, the one who didn't want to be known for following Jesus, but was curious enough about the Christ that he had to know more. Why did he come at night? He came because he wanted to be close But he didn't want to be seen as being too close to Jesus, because Jesus was a risk. He might have been wondering, what if people see me? What impact might that have on my status and my well-being, upon my power and position? He might have been concerned that following Jesus would interfere with his life. You see, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. But not just any Pharisee, he was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Those were the elite of the religious rulers. 
they were the governing body. The Sanhedrin was governed all the Jewish people. They heard trials, they enforced the Mosaic laws, they provided direction and interpretation to the entire Jewish people. So Nicodemus had religious power and status. He had also financial status. Nicodemus was an extremely wealthy man. According to one of the extra-biblical sources called the Talmud, he was one of the three most wealthy men in Jerusalem, it is written. The combined wealth of these three men could have run the entire city for over 20 years. That's a lot of money. That, that Jerusalem of that day, which is where he was, Jerusalem would have been like the modern-day New York City or maybe Washington, D.C. Can you imagine having enough wealth among three people that you could run the entire city for several years? This makes Nicodemus somewhat like uh, Jeff uh, Bezos. Do you all, you all know who Jeff Bezos is? Jeff Bezos is the owner of, uh, of Amazon, which we're all getting ready to use at this Christmas season. We're going to make him even wealthier. But he is the, mo- the wealthiest person in the world, according to Forbes magazine. The richest man at $143 billion. So Nicodemus was a little bit like Jeff Bezos. There was a lot at stake for Nicodemus. He had religious authority. He had power and influence in the community because of that status. And he had the economic viability to do whatever he wanted and to have anybody else do whatever he wanted them to do. Like the rich young ruler seen in Luke chapter 18, 18 through 30. When Jesus heard this, that the rich man had obeyed all of the laws, he said to that rich man, you still lack one thing. Jesus said to that man, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me, he said. You see, I love the Gospel of John for many reasons, but one of them is that John is so so uh, adept at showing how having a relationship with Jesus changes one's life and how it moves us from a centeredness of ourself into an other-centeredness, a centeredness that is in Christ that goes right back to that theme verse that you would deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. So then we read in this story about Nicodemus in the first few chapters into those middle chapters in chapter 7 of John, a transition that begins to happen with Nicodemus. He moves from a fan to someone who will stand up for Jesus. In John chapter 7, verses 50 and 52, it goes like this. Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus previously, being one of them, that is, being one of the religious Pharisees, the rulers, who came to question Jesus. He said to them, Our law doesn't judge a man before it hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? You aren't from Galilee too, are you? The other Pharisees asked of Nicodemus. They replied, Investigate and you will see that no prophet arises from Galilee. You see, Jesus had continued to amaze people in his ministry. He had gone all throughout the city and people were following him and and learning from him and being healed by him and powerful things were beginning to happen. And Nicodemus was experiencing this and I suspect that he was hiding in the shadows and listening to Jesus and seeing what Christ was doing and seeing the change that was coming in other people and he wanted that change for himself, but he was afraid The Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, they send some people to go and investigate this man, Jesus. And they tell them to go and arrest him and bring him back to the before the Sanhedrin that they may try him. And their intent is to arrest him for heresy. And those who go to arrest Jesus, instead they listen to Jesus and they see what he's doing and they find no fault in what he's doing. And in fact, their lives are changed by it. So they come back to the Sanhedrin and they say to those Pharisees, we we couldn't arrest him. We found nothing that we could hold him for. The Pharisees are upset by this, but that's when Nicodemus says what he does. He stands up. He breaks his silence. He enters into the situation and he takes a stance for the Savior. He begins to risk on the edges of life 
there's a transitioning that a transition that's happening in Jesus's life and it happens in ours or so it should you see Nicodemus the one who snuck around to meet Jesus just a few years ago is now defending him before his peers he's standing up in the authority that he has as a religious ruler and he's saying that I move to take a risk to cost to pay the price that it might cost me to stand up for this man you see standing up for someone takes courage it takes character it also involves a connection to the person on some level perhaps just a surface level you see a, a wrong that is being done you reach out and you stand up and you say stop for that person is relates to you if on no other level a level as another human being that one human being shouldn't do the kinds of things that we see being done sometimes against our other fellow human beings we stand up and say no this is wrong but perhaps it's on a, de a deeper level a different level one of a colleague or a neighbor because we know them and we stand up and, and we we attest to the character of that individual that person because they're a friend Maybe there, as Jesus says in John 15, 15, I no longer call you servant, but I call you friend, for a, a servant doesn't know his master's will, but a friend does. Maybe it's a friendship, and I'll stand with my friends, as I said earlier this morning. So many of you, as friends, so many of our colleagues, my colleagues here, our staff, called me, emailed me, messaged me, and said, whatever you need, let me know. They were there to stand up and stand in the gap for me in a time of need. And we do that. Perhaps it's on an even deeper level. It's a family member, someone that we'll reach out for no matter what. That's what God calls us to, and that's the depth of our relationship with Jesus, that we are perhaps ready to stand up and to attest to who Jesus is. This is what, uh, what we've heard about earlier in this book called Not a Fan. Of, it's called the DTR. The define the relationship moment and this might be one of those moments now where we have to decide to stand up and define the depth of our relationship to suddenly make a choice to follow Jesus knowing that that choice may interfere with our plans in life we see that in Nicodemus he finally had to come to that place where he could no longer go in the shadows of the night to meet Jesus, but instead he had to stand among the Sanhedrin before all the people and say something in defense of this man. And the question is, will we be those who are not just followers of Jesus when it's convenient or when it's easy, when we can go to Christ in the quiet of the night, when no one else will see the impact of that in our lives, will we make the decision instead to stand up even in those moments when it costs us to say that God's love is for all and to share that love and purpose of God's great plan through our lives. We see this further demonstrated in the Gospel of John in the 19th chapter. This same man, Nicodemus, who was in chapter 3 and then in chapter 7 and now in chapter 19, on the death of Jesus, we see the cost. At verse 38, it reads this way. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because of the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might remove Jesus' body. Pilate gave him permission so that he could come and take the body away. Now listen, then Nicodemus, remember? Nicodemus, who had previously come to him at night as well, also came. And he brought a mixture of about 100 pounds or 75. Some of the translations are a little different. But a lot of, of, uh, of myrrh and aloes, of spices to prepare the body. And they took Jesus' body, they wrapped it in linen cloth, and with the aromatic spices, they went and they buried, as was the custom. You see, Nicodemus had become a disciple, a completely committed follower of Jesus Christ. At a time when it was easier to be a fan. In fact, we'd seen fandom by a lot of his followers. This is after Jesus' crucifixion, his death, and now his impending burial. And those followers that were all over the place with Jesus, the disciples themselves even, they've now scattered for fear of what might come to them. 
And in all of that, this man who once came in the darkness now comes out of the shadows and stands up for Jesus and pays a price. He pays a great price to see that Jesus is buried appropriately. There, it's not by accident that we have the amount of, of uh, oils and spices and, and aloes that are be purchased. A hundred pounds, approximately. And it's interesting that when we see this, that this is because uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who gives his tomb, and Nicodemus, who buys all of those items, he believes that Jesus is the Savior. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, for example, he gives a brand new tomb, a tomb that he surely paid somebody else to, to hone into the earth, into the side of this mountain for himself and his family. And he must have paid a lot of money for that. And I suspect that he did it for one of two reasons, and that is giving it to Jesus. One, that he believed what Jesus said, that he would come back on the third day. So he knew that he could give it to Jesus because Jesus was only going to borrow it. Or he gave it to Jesus because it was more important to provide for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, a place to be laid finally to rest. And he didn't care about himself or his family uh, any more than he cared for Jesus. Joseph gives that. But Nicodemus also gives a great amount. He gives 75 or 100 pounds of ointment and spices. That amount of myrrh and aloes brought, bought by Nicodemus was unusual especially for someone who had been crucified on a cross like a criminal. Not, you don't spend that kind of money on a criminal. That large amount of spice was normally only reserved for kings. And so when Nicodemus gives this much, he's saying that not only is this man a king, but he is the king of kings and the lord of lords, and he is my savior. Consider, if you will, in comparison, Matthew chapter 26. While Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon, a man who had a serious skin disease, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of a very expensive fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. And you may remember in the story, there were a lot who criticized him for doing this, saying, that was a worth a lot of money, and that was just one small jar. Multiply that by, by dozens and you get an idea of the price. Or how about in John 12? Then Mary took a pound of fragrant oil, one pound, pure and expensive nard, and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair so the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. Jesus does this, or Nicodemus does this for Jesus at a hundredfold. Not just one pound, not a little bit, but a lot. There are some estimates that this was $10,000 or more, dollars, maybe $20,000 worth of, of oil and, and spices that were given to the Savior. Why? Why does John give us that specific number? I always tell people in my Bible studies that I teach, if you get a detail like this, pay attention. It's not there by accident. Like after Jesus was raised from the dead and he went to the lake shore and they were fishing and it says that the disciples gathered in a whole net of fish and it count, they counted them by 133 fish. And I always tell people, why is it that we have 133 fish or we know that it was 100 pounds or 75 pounds of spices, but we have no idea what Jesus did in his life from the age of 12 until 30? I mean, come on! What we're being told in this is that when Nicodemus spent that kind of money. It's because he had decided to move from fandom to being a fully committed follower of Christ. To be all in. And that's what I want to close with. So are you ready to move from fandom where you're in secret faith, avoiding faith, or budgeted faith, or casual faith, to being a follower? which is shared faith, committed faith, confident faith, costly faith, faith that faces fear and goes forth into those places where we've not yet trod. On my way here this morning, I was listening to the radio and the song All In by Matthew West came on. Not by chance, I think. It's one of those moments that I often call a, a God wink moment. It's when God is looking at you and kind of gives you the wink, lets you know I'm there. I heard this song as I was coming this morning, rolling my sermon over in my head, and I began to listen to the song. 
I'd never really listened to the words before. I want you to hear them. My feet are frozen on this middle ground. The water's warm here, but the fire's gone out. I played it safe for so long, the passion left. Turns out safe is just another word for regret. So I step to the edge and I take a deep breath. We're all dying to live, but we're all scared to death. And this is the part where my head tells my heart, you should turn back around, but there's no turning back now. I'm going all in, head first into the deep, and I'm calling you, and this time the fear won't win. I'm going all in. All to you, Jesus, I freely give. As long as there's breath in these lungs, I will live. With reckless abandon, my heart in your hands, I surrender it all. I'm going all in. And that's my question to you today. Will you, with me, decide to go all in? Friends, I know the new year ahead of us holds a lot of questions, uncertainties, fears, anxieties, anticipations that are not so good about what the future might hold. I know that there is information that you've received about what's ahead for us as a community and our worship schedules and about our building and, and all of those things that we face in the new year and about our denomination itself as to what the future is for it. And we can face those with fears and anxieties and uncertainties and measured response. Or we can decide, as Nicodemus finally did, and that is to stand the ground, to stand up, and to declare in the name of Christ that we will be those who will love without condition as Jesus loved us, and that we will be those who share the light and glory of the Lord in this community, that we will make the commitment to connect imperfect people to a perfect God in the imperfect ways that we will do it. And that no matter what the future holds, we will hold this in our hearts, that God holds the future in his hands. I'm all in. How about you? Let's pray.